Hi everyone, and welcome to the second BBI Judgment webinar series. Uh, my name is Joe Kubuthi. Uh, this webinar series is in partnership with the Elephant and Heritage Wealth Foundation uh, to, that seeks to explain, to, to understand the implications of the June 2nd BBI judgment in the context of what's happening in the country, but in this case particular, the context of the youth and the inclusivity, the inclusivity, inclusivity question. Today, I'm joined by uh, four panelists who will be discussing with me uh, what, what the BBI judgment means for, for the youth and what it means in, for, for the country moving forward. Uh, uh, first and foremost, I'd like to introduce uh, to, my, to my nearest right, uh, uh, Dr. Ngala Chome. Uh, Dr. Ngala Chome is a, is a historian, a writer, a uh, recent, recently f uh, finished his PhD, uh, understanding, the, understanding the history of, of the coast. Uh, he's, been, he's been involved mainly in research around terrorism, uh, violent extremism, uh, in the coast and other and marginalized areas around the coast. Uh, Karibu Chome. Thank you. Secondly, I, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Lorraine Wesonga. Uh, Lorena Kowasanga is a Shevening scholar. She's a researcher, an academic, a, a writer, uh, who, whose main research interests are uh, involved mainly around uh, uh, governance uh, within the context of the post-colonial state. Uh, thirdly, uh, is Darius Okola. Darius Okola is an economist, uh, a writer, a researcher, uh, currently the audiovisual curator at The Elephant. And, last, and lastly, but not least, uh, is Ashiko Kihika. Uh, Ms. Shiko Hikika is the executive director of Tribeless Youth, an organization that tries to foster a new kind of politics uh, within, within, within the youth bracket of Kenya. She's, a, she's an activist, a social commentator, um, among many other things. Uh, Karibuni Nyote uh, to, this, to this webinar. Asante. Thank you. Asante. I think we, I just want to just start with, uh, with Shiko. Uh, uh, just if if you may, I mean, on June second, uh, uh, we had the high court, the high court, the high court ruling, uh, you know, uh, later on a uh, ruling of the BBI judgment, uh, calling it null, void, and unconstitutional. Uh, for for someone who works particularly with uh, the urban youth, uh, urban and marginalized areas, uh, the urban poor, uh, what what are some of your immediate reflections, and and what this means for them? Uh, for me, I think this meant. Uh, there's hope. It meant that not every single arm of the government has been gagged by the government itself. So just seeing that come out, it meant that for a common uh, person, there is hope. What we saw over and over again were threats, um, threats from the government, threats from um, those people who were in dire need for this document to actually go through for whatever reasons. Um, but then coming, coming out and seeing how these judges expounded and confidently put out um, these issues and seeing how much they fought and defended the current constitution that we have, for me, this meant that all is not lost, that we might be going through a lot right now, but there is actually hope to redeem ourselves. Over to you, Darius. What, what, are, some of the just, what are some of the immediate reflections that you have around uh, the BBI uh, June 2nd judgment and what it means for, for this country? Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I think for me, the, the major issues that they raised, which is they basically said, uh, if you're going to go through with um, a referendum that will change the constitution, you basically have to do issues of you know, civic education, you have to put in um, public education, you know, public participation, you have to put in a constitutional uh, you know, assembly, and then a referendum. The fact that they were affirming there, there, there's a process, there's a way to go about this um, journey. And most importantly is the fact that within the age of these spaces, whether it's the civic education, whether it's the public participation, whether it's the constitutional assembly, and finally even the referendum itself, there are youths, there are young people involved in all these processes in various and different capacities. And each one of them is able to at the very least, speak into you know the the process of trying to change the constitution. So the fact that you know uh, Judge Mateka and Odunga and uh, you know Joel Ngugi and their colleagues affirmed that you know basically affirmed um, the the fact that we are not a country of you know where you wake up in the morning and make a roadside declaration 
or a document that is pushed in, uh, you know, to Kenyans by a president, you know, a presidential will, but that we are a country with processes, we are a country with systems, and all these systems are robust enough to be able to accommodate as much views as possible, including that of the younger people, and that you have to follow this process if at the very end you want a legitimate um, outcome. So I found that very affirming. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Darius. And over to you, Ngala, but even, even as you speak about uh, the BB, BBI judgment, if you'd also locate this within Kenyans, Kenya's historical constitutional struggle and what this judgment means for that history. Yeah, I mean, the, um, the BBI judgment was very clear that um, it was paying attention to the history of constitutional um, um, uh, making and reform in Kenya. Um, two, two major historical, historic things to take note of for the, from the judgment, of course, is the, is the, is the invoking of the doctrine of, uh, of, of, of basic structure and, 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 and paying attention to, 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 to the history of constitutional struggle or constitutional reform in Kenya. And it is the paying attention to that process that then leads uh, 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 um, to the conclusion that for, 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 for the BBA process to be termed as a popular initiative, it needed to go through these processes that Darius has just kind of um, enumerated, you know, civic education, uh, um, uh, public participation. It's actually a process that would have taken about, about two to three years um, um, if, if it really followed this process that, that, that the judgment um, um, had, had, had um, put forth. Um, but then again, to link constitutional, our history of constitutional making in Kenya and, and, the question, and, and this question of the youth, I think it is also important to, to, to recognize that Kenya gained independence and, um, with, a very youthful, with a very youthful political class. Um, uh, you know, our first constitutional minister, uh, Tom Boyer, uh, was constitutional minister when he was when he was in his thirties. I think he was about 33, 34 years old, and 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 many you know many 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 powerful um, um, uh, senior politicians at that time um, were, were, were actually youth. Uh, so I think the question as we as we as we progress uh, in this discussion today is what happens after that, right? Um, why is this category of youth that we have, you know, that we have we have now learned to call youth? Um, um, why? How does it become excluded from power? How does it become excluded from 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 decision making over the years? And and why also over the years is this category of youth uh, deemed as 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 problematic to the to the to the prevailing you know political class? And and I think this thinking is also written within 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 the BBI process itself and the BBI report itself. Uh, uh, the youth seen, being being seen as a category that that either needs um, salvation or is actually the problem when 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 when, when, when it comes to um, political conflict, right? Um, so I guess I guess this is these are questions that I'm sort of um, I'm sort of uh, hitting at now that 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 you know we'll we'll, we'll address later in the in the in, in the discussion. Thanks, th thanks for that, Angela. But just to pick you back on what you've said uh, around, you know, how we have framed this youth, the youth in Kenya, as you know, there, there is two prong ideas as as the category of people to be saved on one hand, but on the other hand, as 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 people who you know cause violence and etc. People who you know these rogues, you no know, rogues, twanting around, and over to you, Shiko. Uh, for I mean, you lo looking at now the the BBI report. And does it does it in your view? Does it one how does it how, how how does it frame the youth question? But then secondly, does it does it does it uh, solve the 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 youth question in particular to inclusivity and especially for uh, the urban youth who uh, many times feel uh, marginalized during uh, election, usually the face of the, the face of the violence. Do you think that? the BBI process and the report itself fixes this issue? Actually, no. Um, I think BBI is a joke, one, uh, <laughs> just to put it out there. Because um, I look at what they've put there for young people, uh, considering that this is what they claim to be the majority of the population, which is true, but also the, the population that is very much unemployed and very much vulnerable. And like what um, Ngala said that 
we are that, that, that generation where they feel like um, this is the generation that needs help, but at the same time, they're the chaotic generation. Then you tell us the only thing you have for us is uh, for you to help us get jobs and be stable enough is to give us seven years tax holiday. And on top of that, you continue taxing us. And on top of that, you, you, you sort of uh, just sit and watch as we lose more jobs. So for me, um, if I'm to talk like a common young person, is that BBI has nothing for me. BBI is just a political document that is meant to sustain the old guards in power, that is meant uh, to, and I'm sorry to say if this had someone, but it's meant to safeguard the wealth of the thieves. So we have to sit here and for them, youth right now is the block that will pass BBI. Mm -hmm. Because of course their normal strategy is they come and give us money, we campaign for them, we vote for them, you know. Right. They forget that the youth is waking up. They forget that the same youth they're talking about. You know, it's funny because the old guards right now were the youth who fought for this constitution. Now they are old enough to realize, oh, the, youth, the, the constitution actually has a problem that we are the ones to change. Why don't mm. they allow us now who are benefiting from this, who will leave the same constitution to our kids to actually sit and analyze it and say, these are the problems that we see that we can actually go and work and try to fix them. You do not come and force an illegal process on people the way they are forcing it. And I think the bigger question we should be having and we should have had from the beginning is, what was so important that the president and his brother Raila felt like they needed to threaten us to pass this document? What is this hidden treasure that was in this document that they could not even take time to print some copies so that they get to common people for reading? Because if we remember well, someone like Orengo before the constitution 2010, when the first draft was made, they are the first people who advocated to get the Gazette notice printed out and sent to people. So why is it that right now is a different conversation? Why is it that right now we don't need to read it that way? We, we have a link online and that should be enough. Then we are forgetting that we are still in the same quote unquote digital government, but a country that has a huge population of its people not even accessing electricity, live alone internet. Mm. So I, I just think like this was a stance. It has nothing, nothing for the young people. They're, they're just doing the same thing, blind us so that we feel like this document is pretty. You're gonna tell us you're giving us seven years tax holiday, then you, you'll keep borrowing and, and increasing, uh, increasing our revenues out here. So how is that logical? How are you going to make sure that the biggest uh, task force, the labor force of this country is going right. for seven years without paying taxes? Then mm -hmm. we cannot forget that youth is transitional. You're only a youth for less than 16 years. Then after that, what happens? So seven years of your youthhood, you wouldn't be paying taxes. Then when you start paying taxes, what happens? So I, I just think it's a lie, it's a big lie. And mm -hmm. it's a way of blending the youth as they're used to doing to just uh, make sure they follow and uh, just vote for the documents. Okay, Gala, I mean, over, oh, just uh, the big one of the, one of the, the nine point agenda of the people, one of them was ending, ending electoral violence. And for someone who has, who has researched uh, comes from uh, a marginalized uh, part of Kenya, the coastal, the coastal, the coastal part, uh, who has worked on uh, extreme violence, uh, extremist violence within both within both within uh, uh, Kenya's political uh, political landscape, but even just even within the, the religious, particularly Islam. Uh, do you think BBI is solving will solve this problem? This question of Marginalization. I think. I, I think we need. We need to be clear about what we mean when we talk about marginalization. In the sense that who 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 is being marginalized, right? So, right. you know. So, like, people can talk of ethnic marginalization in this country. People can also talk of the marginalization of young people. People can also talk of the, of the marginalization of women. People can also talk of the of, of the marginalization of of, um, of 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 religious minorities. So, in this case, Muslims. Um, so there are very different ways of like discussing and approaching the subject of marginalization, but 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 there is one way in which uh, in you know in Kenyan political history we have we have come to understand the the concept of marginalization and we have come to associate it with, in particular, ethnic and regional ma marginalization, right? So in this case, um, they're talking about regions like like northeastern Kenya, um, and northern Kenya much more widely the Kenyan coast 
Um, and, and if you go back to the 60s, um, you know, even regions such as the, 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 the parts, parts of the Rift Valley and, and Western Kenya, you know, saw themselves as, as being excluded regions coming out of that colonial experience. You know, so like the division between Kanu and Kadu in, in 1961, between 1961 and 1963, um, um, you know, around this idea of Majimbo, which basically was was a was a proposal for, you know, sort of it was sort of like a quasi federal system, whereby um, the Kenyan state will be will be properly decentralized and and power and resources will be transported or transferred from Nairobi um, um, to 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 eight regions, right? That 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 will make policy around land, around employment. Um, um, and, and, and around basically how 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 to 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 spend revenue within those regions, right? So of course we know that system did not work, or actually was not allowed to work. Um, and by 1964, Kenya was back into into a heavily centralized state controlled from Nairobi, right? And you know Kenyan politics since then has been um, a, a struggle between um, uh, political elites from 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 these ethno regions to control that center. Right, which is why it became it became very unstable, especially with the reintroduction of multi-party politics in the 1990s. Um, so, it seems for me that this the solution has always been to decentralize. Right, how right. to include to include regions that has have, have felt have felt excluded from the central system. Um, that has been dominated by a cabal of elites uh, from particular regions of the country was to was to was to decentralize, right? But you know, but but you know that by two thousand and seven, um, with the post-election violence, the term Majimbo had acquired you know negative connotations, right? It was associated as as being behind um, not only the population violence of 2007, but also all the ethnic clashes in the 1990s, 92 and 97. And so therefore, um, um, you know, uh, that, that association with, 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 with violence, you know, ODM, which was the party that has supported Majimbo in 2007, you know, they sort of had to move away from that concept after, after 2007, which is why um, and there's a lot of detail there, but this is why we end up with 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 a with devolution at the level of 47 counties and not and not going back to the 60s in this kind of region, right? So that I have to say that from the coast, for example, um, the current system of of decentralization, which is devolution at the level of 47 counties, um, was not received with a lot of with a lot of enthusiasm on the coast. You know, people people had expected a you know the the cost to be to to be a government, and 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 if the cost was a government, then it would have much more power to decide the fate of the region, right? In, in, including mm -hmm. land, including resources, including employment. That these small counties, uh, uh, six counties on the coast, for example, um, could not play that role or could not address the popular perceptions that people had regarding regarding uh, what decentralizing the state should, should mean, right? So already there with the 2010 constitution um, um, becomes very disappointing when, when it comes to including these regions that had felt, you know, that had felt excluded from the center. But one thing to note is that, um, you know, in fact, in fact, in fact, in the, on the coast, the devolution was dismissed as Vijimbo, right? And, and Vijimbo is to say that um, not only were they small in size, but they're also small in function and power. Right, um, um, but but you know these are the sentiments that I was collecting, you know, around 2012, 2013. Um, you know, ten years later, or or say, um, well, during the last elections and after, people had seen that the counties could do something that they had not seen before. Right. So so you know it went from it went from people being disappointed with devolution. To the cost producing politicians by 2017, who are the who are the who are the best defenders of devolution? You know, talking about Hassan Yo, for example, of Mombasa, who was caught in, in this battle with, with the president um, um, and, and, and coming out as, as the champion of devolution because he comes from a region where devolution had been popular as an idea because people had felt excluded from, from, from the national central system, right? 
So right. that I think then is the is the is is the narrative of like how do we involve regions that have been excluded from from the center through constitutional making? Devolution was offered as the solution. Now, what does the BBI do to to that kind of proposal? The only thing that I've seen in the BBI proposal is to increase revenue, right? So it has become a very economic. Um, it has a very like it's, it's a very there's a very economic language to it, right? It's just or oh, increase money. <laughs> And um, um, but I, but I think like it's it's deeper than that, um, it, um, and it and this also ties in with with how we've looked at the question around youth, and I think we still need to also disabuse this fact that we have a monolithic category of youth. Um, uh, but but I, but I think also the way that we have looked at the problem of the youth is also to throw money at it, right? Mm. And 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 to talk about all they need jobs. Right, um, right. Um, but 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 usually I think that misses the point. Um, um, it's usually a question around power and power recognition, respect, um, um, and the feeling that your voice is being heard. Right, these 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 far deeper questions I think are is 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 what matters when it comes to not only regions that are felt excluded, but also but also uh, many many young people in this country. Precisely. I mean, we'll I'll, before, before I jump back to, to, to Darius to talk about uh, the, the, this economic logic around the BBI, uh, just to go back to you, Shiko. Uh, you know, uh, the, la the last couple of years, but it, uh, there, there's been a lot of conversations around the question of women in politics. And BBI in particular, uh, BBI in particular has really uh, anchored itself as, as trying to really uh, convince this, this particular constituent of its, of its necessity. Uh, we have seen, we have seen in, in, the, in the document, there's these conversations around having 40, 47 Senate, another 47 plus senators, uh, just exclusive for the women. Uh, what, do you, what do you make of, 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 this, of this process and how, and how it has uh, involved or not involved uh, women as a constituent to, uh, for, 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 its, for, its, for its gains? I, I find it weird that we are trying to uh, do away with one thing, which is the women repositions to increase the Senate positions. And I see like in our normal setup, our parliament, uh, especially now the, the National Assembly has more powers than the, the Senate we have. Right. So are you not telling us indirectly that we are giving you more positions, but at the same time, we are going to cripple your voices within that statement? And, and it's funny how our political parties, which are very much um, illegally constituted because our political parties don't even meet the two that gender rule. They are going to tell us how they're gonna form a government that is going to honor that. I don't think it really makes sense. And, and for me is about looking at it beyond, we have a government that says, but never does. So I'm just looking at how we have a very good president who knows how, how good to talk to people and how to tell people what they want to hear. But when it comes to actually working, it's a matter of him sponsoring hashtags, but not really working. So this same guy is gonna tell us how, if we offer these slots to women, then we're gonna be uh, achieving the two-third gender rule. I don't think we need all that. The two-third gender rule can easily be achieved if our political parties honored that same statement, if they were legally constituted, if they included women from the beginning, you cannot have a party where the entire leadership is masculine and then come tell us how once they get into power, they're going to make sure that uh, we meet the two-third gender rule. I, I think it's a lie. And I think um, the, the realization that our women and especially women in politics have been used as puppets for the longest time they are always the mouthpieces of uh, their senior bosses who are masculine. So it's always weird when I find it that um, these women who are telling us how they're gonna be included in this document, they were not even included in the process of understanding what could have made sense information of uh, an all-inclusive uh, parliament or government. So for me, I don't think it really makes sense. And I feel like um, this is how the same way Ngala has put it uh, in a very diplomatic manner, I'm not that diplomatic, but the same way he's done it, uh, I'll just say in, a, in, in one word, this thing is a scam. So we beautify it with words, we do all these things, but it's not meant to actually do what it needs to do. Mm. 
Thanks, thanks for that. Uh, Darius, over to you. I mean, there's, there's this part, part of the whole process of BPI was a conversation around making a, making a bigger cake. And part of that conversation was, as Ngala has mentioned, uh, increasing revenues to the, to the counties, uh, right? And from 15% to 35%. And with that came the conversations around uh, youth commission, uh, you know, seven year tax relief. But, but as, a, as, an, as an economist, if, if, you, if you kindly contextualize uh, what BPI, one, it means its implementation means for the cost of the economy, but even two, just where do we find ourselves today uh, that BBI is a solution or not a solution for this country economically? I mean, that's an interesting one, Joe, because um, given where we are as a country, this is a country with a population of about what, about 54 million, give or take. Um, I mean, that, that population is about 28.5 million of that. Um, when you think about the fact that the average Kenyan is actually 19.7 years, you know, these are pretty young populations, a very young um, population. And part of the reason we ended up with the 2010 constitution as a uh, uh, Ngala and uh, Shiko have affirmed is because there's too much pressure at the center. You know, you have centralized so much of your national reality that it becomes a matter of life and death for you know, pretty much every cluster out there and particularly tribes. So everyone wants to have their person as the president because you know that if you do not cleanse the presidency, you are out in the cold as a community, as a region, as a cluster. And so having devolution there for all its uh, you know, shortcomings uh, was in one way to begin to release this pressure from the center, to begin to push resources outwards, to push representation outwards, to begin to create development in spaces that had not been considered for that before. And of course, where do the young people fit into this? It's the fact that this country has a very young population, number one, but also number two, it's a very labor intensive economy. You know, we have a lot of, uh, you know, a very huge workforce, which we need to be able to absorb into the, you know, into the economy basically. And devolution has achieved a part of that. Trying to push a lot of some of these resources out from the center um, is critical. I don't think we went the full implementation of um, how much we could do with this. So for example, um, we give 15% uh, to the counties, okay. How about, um, I mean, pushing this figure to 35 would not have required the kind of amendments um, the, uh, basically uh, the two brothers were asking for you know, the two political brothers are asking for. And in a sense, um, that being just one of them, the fact that this is sort of a disguise trying to, you know, use it to sweeten a document that in essence, all its other classes do not represent uh, what would have fared well for the youth, especially in terms of employment. But also, I mean, as I said, the devolution conversation needed to go beyond um, just having the county units and the monies that we send into those county units. How about we also devote parastatos? I mean, what is an irrigation board doing in Upper Hill? I mean, seriously, you know, mm -hmm. and you could mention many other, um, you know, uh, parastatos, government agencies, secretariats that really do not need to exist here within the center. But also more importantly, the money that came in last year uh, in March, uh, by estimates, um, I think, uh, the president got about 340 something billion shillings. So part of the COVID um, recovery packages, some of the loans that were taken, grants here and there. And that's just the figures, you know, some new figures are coming out. I mean, there's a whole bunch of uh, finances, uh, you know, that need to be accounted for in terms of, you know, the kind of deals you're getting into to get these monies. But also last year, uh, by getting that money, by the time that some of that money begins to come in, the government or um, small suppliers, I think around 136 billion, you know, uh, give or take. Now, a lot of this money is owed to people who, um, basically the small contractors to government um, agencies, uh, parastatals, the national government itself, and you know, the various other arms of, uh, you know, uh, and appendages of, of the state. Now, Considering that a lot of these people are not paid, the impact of it was very straight up on the economy. So for example, um, there's a, a report that came out somewhere around the November of last year that basically said we created a new cluster of Kenyans, uh, about 2 million people um, who 
sunk below our definition of poverty line, which itself has a bit of problem, but you know, for the purposes of this conversation, that means basically about 400,000 uh, Kenyans, majority of these people being young, were sinking into poverty every month. When the president has borrowed 348 billion, which could not be clearly accounted for, or which a third of it would have been enough to clear um, a lot of the debt or especially the small monies, the monies owed to the small uh, and medium sized businesses. So to try and say that um, uh, pushing this uh, state funding to you know 35%, which is good in and of itself, that that requires uh, the kind of us to accepting um, the other provisions that are giving. Um, first of all, that's not, it's a bad deal, all around bad deal. But also there are many other mechanisms and opportunities, or opportunities he's had to push money out of the center and into the hands of young people that he's not taken advantage of, not just in the last like a year or two, uh, but almost pretty much throughout the last seven years. So as I was mentioning on that report, we had, I mean, that's 2 million people. They're actually a new cluster in Kenya now known as, you know, an, a, a young cluster now known as the newly poor. And most of it was better educated, um, you know, uh, mostly younger people and it's families, you know, households, basically. So when we come back to a space where you're saying, we'll give you 35%, uh, this 35%, of course, um, increases representation in terms of the infrastructural development that can be done on the ground, in terms of capacity building for a lot of young people, in terms of increasing uh, basically the scope of what you can be able to do with, you know, both taxes and non-tax revenues uh, by the state. But all around, the way it's being sold out there is not the best way to go about it. And the fact that they've had opportunities to fix this thing along the way, and they've not done it, that in itself tells you you're dealing with a government that is simply trying to sweeten a bad deal. And also critically remember that that report came out in November, two months early in September of um, 2020, a new report came out that said 2.15 million young people have basically given up um, uh, looking for employment, you know, basically looking for jobs. They send their CVs, 600, you know, whatever number of organizations and got into a space where they just said, you know what, I'm not doing this anymore. That, that, that's such a huge number. When you have 2.15 million um, young people, of course, going by the constitutional article 260 definition of young people, which is 18 to 35, who basically got into a place of despair and they're saying, you know what, I'm not doing this anymore. Where are these people? What is their, you know, uh, the understanding of uh, how things are working now? What is their concept, uh, conception of the state right now? How do they, uh, conceptualization of the state, how do they view the, the, the state right now? How do they view the idea that somebody wants to change the basic doctrine of the, gov of the government to put some money into devolution, but in a way that does not even address their immediate demands, which is you need to rejig this economy to create, to put it in a space where it's able to put more money into their hands. So overall, no, I don't think the BBI addresses that. I think uh, in many ways, every other provisions they try to put out there does not necessarily um, you know, have the capacity to be able to you know, put this 2.1 million back into work and take the 2 million households, which mostly fall, as I said, um, young and educated, back into spaces where they're able to, you know, either their previous level of a lifestyle or even better than that. And none of the advantages that could have been, you know, none of the opportunities that could have fixed this thing from the get-go have been taken. So for, as uh, Shiko said, this has come. Mm. Shiko, uh, just coming to you with some of the things that Darius has mentioned, but but also just uh, the, the BPI report uh, uh, has been talking about uh, you know, creating, uh, like expanding the executive, uh, expanding the executive, and uh, and a lot of feedback that has that has been coming out of this is, is you you're, you're creating positions for the five for the five big ethnic groups. Uh, for someone who has worked for the last almost ten years, you know, in the organization of trying to build a society whereby the youth, uh, particularly, don't associate politically, uh, move politi polit politically uh, based on their ethnicities, uh, based on their tribes, but can vote based on issues. How does how does how does how does this what the BBA report wants to do, and some of the things that you have been doing uh, in your institution and and working with youth, how how does how what's what's the symbiosis if there is any? 
Jo, we've been in operation for four years, going to, uh, to five, not 10. Whoa. Oh, yeah. I was a first time voter, so you can tell. Um, yeah. But, <laughs> but um, when you look at these things and you, you look at what Darius has said is very true. And there's a question that we never have a genuine conversation about, the leadership of this country. Even if we talk about the expansion of uh, the executive, when will Amijikenda somewhere have a seat there? Well, when will be a Tesla somewhere say that one day I'm the president of this country? So we still have not addressed the issue of inclusivity, uh, like Ngala said. There is a way that we know how to uh, sugarcoat these things and make them look beautiful, but then we're only creating, and I'll be as raw as it is, um, we are creating positions for Kikuyus, Luo, uh, Kalenjins, Luyas, and Kambals. We are not creating positions for anyone else. And unfortunately, it's not even the five. It's, up, it's now the Kikuyus, Luos, and the Kalenjins. So we must start thinking beyond that box of these, um, this thing that there are tribes that have to get some certain positions. I was among the people who like really questioned our censors um, outcomes when they say that Kikuyus are still the majority. And I was challenging someone and saying, with all my illiteracy, if I can think and think properly, in the Kikuyu land, people my age have one or two kids at most. Our parents have a maximum of four kids. When I look at other tribes, and to be specific, if I am compared to a Luya girl my age, she has three or four kids. And you're gonna sit here and still tell us that, oh, Kikuyu are still the majority. That's a lie. It's a political statement for me. So unless we start interrogating these things from a point of, are censors done to manipulate elections or are they done to actually figure this out uh, in terms of uh, the distribution of resources? Right. Even when the BBI talks about um, the expansion of even the counties, who benefits most? Central gets the majority of um, uh, the, the, the division of these mm. constituencies. So right. what does this mean that most, most of these resources will be pumped back to central province? Does this also raise eyebrows in terms of when will someone from uh, the northeastern part of this country benefit from this so-called document? Because I think northeastern would have deserved that better in terms of development and uh, channeling more resources to it. So I just feel like everything that is being done is to create positions for three tribes, not even the five. And um, it's not even also about tribes, it's about the people who term themselves as kingpins of these tribes. And what happens is that they have the fear, and I'm sorry to say, they are scared to lose because in a few years, they won't be alive. In 10 to 15 years, most of these people won't be breathing. So what is happening is they're trying to compete for these resources right now so that they can amass or uh, amass a lot of wealth for their people during this time. Because unlike their forefathers, they have not nurtured their kids to sort of come and take over. Or rather their kids are so much disconnected with this world because they've not gone through the struggles of this country. They've known life of the Western and they, I don't think they can deal with the kind of setup of uh, the kind of life that we live. So it becomes very hard for them to say that we're gonna hand over to our kids. So what do they do? They want to take up these spaces make the best of it in the next 10 years, 15 years. And then by the time they are done with us, we can't breathe, we can't do anything else. Mm. Thank, thanks, Chico Ngala. I mean, the, the BBI report uh, talks, 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 talks a lot about this, this thing called culture and uh, how it frames uh, the culture conversation, uh, uh, likens us back to, in, in a sense, how, how, how the, British, the, British, uh, the British colonizer talked about uh, ethnicities and tribe. When 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 they're colonizing us from 1885 to 1963, uh, what do you, what do you make of of the language that's that's used uh, in the BBI report that that's very very similar, particularly as related to culture, uh, when it talks about tribes, ethnicities, and African traditional customs, etc. So, like, I think I think we just have to say that the BBI. But the, the entire BBA process and, and the two reports, you know, it's it's a very paternalistic process, you know. Um, um, you know, the fact that it was decided in a boardroom and, 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 you know, the details did not come out very clear immediately thereafter. 
you know, t t you know, it 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 tells you something about about the sort of um, political psychology of of of, of its promoters, um, but which is why you know it it, is, it has now gotten into problems. But but also, but also, you know, the language around around their their understanding of what Kenyan culture is or should be, you know, um, um, it's it's it it's it's it's, it's actually like very misplaced you know like if you read the first bbi report you will think that it's it's declaring a war um um on kenyan citizens for you know for for not being patriotic enough for 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 demanding rights but not really um and thinking about responsibilities all this language is colonial language and 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 it is not surprising because you know the current political elite which as as Shiko, you know elaborately explains um is on its way out and it's really struggling to stay on course and it's using it's using mechanisms such as the bbi to, to do so but i but i don't think there's there's there's, there's, there's a lot of options actually um, um um but 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 there's something i just wanted to say that that you know this kind of i mean of course the bbi was not created just to to um to support the youth you know it, it's 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 not <laughs> it's very obvious that i didn't even feel, i didn't even feel to mention it um um but 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 it's important to understand why um so for me look looking at uru kenyatta himself i think uru kenyatta came to power um as 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 they said you know kibaki came to power on a wheelchair um uru came to power with a serious legitimacy question in 2013 um um he he was actually he was actually going through a case at the international criminal court when he was president like this is something we shouldn't forget like this is a very serious um like this these are very serious crimes he had he had he had been charged um uh, um um you know even even when he was president and therefore i think and, and the fact that he didn't win with a with a with a with a huge majority, even in 20, you know, in 2013 and in 2017, uh, really informs the kind of president he becomes, right? So, so uh, someone was telling me that you know, Uru likes to be liked, also, you know, um, he really likes that, and and the fact that he did win with a with a with a majority in both elections, 2013 and, 20, and, and 2017. I think in 2013 it was even it was even it was even a, a much more slim margin. In, 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 in 2013, and and becoming president with this with this serious case, at, you know, um, at, 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 at the International Criminal Court, I feel like he needed to justify his rule, especially the first five years, um, um, so much, which is why he got into he got into he got into problems with the opposition, and and became and became a very in the process he became a very arrogant president um, at the first five years. Now, with 2017 and what happens there after the elections, for me, I've always felt that he feared that on his on his on his last term in office, um, that he would have been he would be Kenya's president for 10 years, who was rejected by almost half of the country. Right? And and this, and I think this really got to him, right? So so the 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 fact and the things that Raila was doing, you know, after after August 2017, um, I'm calling for a boycott, um, um, in, not only of of the of the repeat poll, but but also of 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 certain of certain of, of certain companies that were associated by the president's family. Um, the Supreme Court, you know, um, declaring you know the the presidential results null and void. I think like I think like all these all these things affected how Uhuru then would felt be, began to feel about his legacy after after leaving power. Now the thing about it is we should not think of our political elite as a very smart um, you know um, um, network engaged in a conspiratorial sort of a, a sort of a, a, a secret uh, to, to 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 maintain their hold on power. Um, um, because I don't know why people do not think of civic education. You know, people do not think of no one thought of that, right? So, like, I feel I feel like at the beginning, um, be, because the Kenyan political elite is so used to 
working with old means. They actually do not know that, you know, the situation has changed. It's like they didn't pay attention to the fact that the judiciary has been transformed. It's like they didn't know that. It's like they didn't know that people could go to court and challenge that process. Um, um, and, and we're operating in the same way that, you know, politicians would operate in the 60s and 70s. You know, this is what Kibaki was doing in, in 2007 with, with that blatant um, 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 stealing, stealing of the elections. You think that you still operate in the same political environment that, that, that Kenyatta operated in the 1960s, 1970s, that things have changed. So the, the political elite is always doing this. A certain section of the political elite is always out of touch with, 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 with how the country has progressed politically. Um, um, so the BBI for me was not surprising, but also the court case challenging the BBI was also not surprising because, because you're facing a political elite that um, his, its, its, its political tools are, are very old um, and, and cannot deal with the current situation, the current political situation or climate we, we have in the country. So, so the language around culture, around expecting people to be um, responsible and not demand rights, that, 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 that is a very old school language. And, I, and, and it, was, it, didn't, it didn't surprise me that this is still the thinking behind, behind, behind um, what, what Uru Kenyatta or Raila Odinga thinks is the problem with this country. It, did, it didn't surprise me. You know, their, their thinking is very old school, but, but the country has changed. Mm. Darius, I mean, Ngala, Ngala in many ways is saying that the old political guard, you know, the, the 60s, elite, as you mentioned, is, is on its way out. Uh, in the interim, I, I don't know, perhaps uh, uh, if you would tell us, uh, a, a lot of the terrain has been captured by, by what you'd call anti-BBI forces and not emanating from uh, the progressive space, but within the political space, particularly particularly with, the, as you mentioned, with how dire the economy is, there are conversations around uh, uh, what deputy, deputy vice president is calling the hustler, the hustler movement. Uh, what do you make of this movement within, within the, the current political climate of BBI and a formation of a, of a, of a new kind of political elite? That would be an interesting, um, you know, seeing who, uh, gets to be part of, uh, you know, the next political elite, if you will, um, and how power will uh, basically reproduce itself um, within our generation. Uh, but we also have to be cognizant of the fact that uh, political um, clusters, political elites like we have right now tend to reproduce after themselves. So sometimes when you say we have more younger people at the top, they're in every way and in every bit representative sometimes and in certain spaces and certain contexts of the, what we would call, quote unquote, the old guard, you know? And so this transitions definitely is something to watch out for. Um, we are a very young country, as I said, I mean, at 19.7 years uh, on average, which means transitions happen very fast in a lot of other spaces. I think it would be important to have that within um, our politics not that we've fared badly before. Um, we have one governor who uh, got into office while he was still um, a youth. The numbers, I think, is almost around 60 for, uh, within uh, the parliament, uh, parliamentary space. That's about uh, 130 something uh, within uh, the, the MCA uh, level. And so, I mean, we've had youth in these spaces. These transitions are really neat and, you know, sort of mm -hmm. um, clear cut point at, uh, you know, a certain, uh, uh, you know, basically dispensation. So they happen gradually and over time, you notice that younger people are stepping into these spaces, including um, the challenge that was done on this BBA document at the courts. Um, I mean, we had Estangawa, we had uh, Ogunda, we had a whole bunch of young people who were central to, you know, the, the, the defense of the constitution recently. So these transitions will happen. Um, these transitions are, are not automatic. Um, a different kind of young people need to step into that space. You cannot simply assume that because it's younger people that they represent um, a different mindset, a different frame, a different way of looking at this thing because the current political space have the resources um, to reproduce themselves in, in basically in the younger people or age mates and sort of to keep perpetuating some of the you know, vices or political vices that we see right now. So it is important that we are able to deliberately stay in that space, deliberately ask not just the youth question, but who really are these young people who want to be in this space and do they represent uh, basically different. When it comes to the Hustler conversation, I mean, it's, 
it was a one time opportunity to have a sort of a ground up um, you know conversation around this country considering the etymology of the word hustler itself how it's been used until up until the time it got politicized i mean it was a way of basically trying to describe um, the lifestyle of many people, how you are able to build yourself on the ground up. The fact that it was politically taken advantage of and uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, taken up by one uh, arm of basically the, the, the current political contestation was a big loss, honestly, within the civic and national um, conversation for people because I mean, you can no longer go out there and say, you know, a hustler, I'm a hustler because it carries certain political undertones, uh, a certain level of political baggage, if you will, um, because of its association with um, the vice president. Having said that, I think younger people have way more opportunities to, you know, challenge a lot of what's happening right now within social media spaces, within publications, within conversations like what we are having here, you know, and in many other spaces and forums where our peers and our age mates are having this conversation. I think it's, it would be important for us to take stock of what we were able to do up until, uh, let's say, 2017, and ask ourselves, can we better that going into 2022? Can we have uh, more women in that spaces? And what are we doing up front to ensure that that works? Are we doing that for people living with disabilities? Are we doing that for you know regional, ethnic, religious minorities? You know, are we doing that for every other cluster of people whose voice is not at the table, you know, so to speak? So in many ways, I think um, the hustler conversation was, you know, unfortunately hijacked, but it was a critical conversation in terms of uh, how we process our social political and social economic realities, especially in terms of um, how people are able to, you know, basically um, honor their kid in this country. I mean, there's the old saying in Nairobi, you know, you know, like you know, Nico to Amana hustle, like leave it at that. You know, people somehow right. find how to make money within this uh, bizarre economy that is very labor intensive without enough opportunities for young people. So within that kind of you know, these uh, number of variables, the, the the core of it would be are we still willing to, you know, what Kiheka is doing with the team to step into that space? Are we preparing enough young people? on this end such that within the next 16 months, you have more representation there, you have more voice there, you have, you're better organized, you know, in that space because nobody's going to hand us anything for free, you know, are we better organized? Are we clear about what we want to go and do in that space, including mm -hmm. right, challenging some of these things, like including some of their political and uh, legislative, um, you know, shenanigans they're playing, BBI being the biggest of them all. So it would be important, number one, to take stock of what we've done. And I think we've done impressively, especially in 2017. And number two, are we building up towards ensuring that this transition is not automatic or a given, but it's something that will be guided towards ensuring that a new crop of people get in there who are able to articulate uh, uh, newer realities in that space, who are able to bring in new perspectives, who are able to challenge some of the age old, age old um, traditions that have been cemented in that space, some right. of which are generational blind spots of you know, the older generations, um, their contributions, of course, notwithstanding. Yeah. Great. Gala, before I just before I go, to, uh, go back to Shiko, uh, uh, Darius has mentioned about you know, this, tra this transition period between this old guard and uh, I mean, we can't call it a new guard yet, but it's, there's a contestation happening. What's the political and historical context uh, finding where we're, where we're seeing this elite fragmentation, but I don't know, this, this elite contest happening today? And, and I think BBI is, is very much part of that uh, contestation. If you, if you yeah. may just contextualize yeah. that for us yeah. historically. So I think, I think that there, um, what, what we need to know, and and yeah. I say something that the, the transitions happen, but sometimes they're not very neat. And, and this is like very, very true. Um, I, th I think what, what we have now in Kenyan politics is that there's a, there's, a, there's a struggle between two generations of a political elite. Yeah. Right. So, so and, and this is informed by like Kenyan history. So Kenya like begins life as a colony, yeah, in 1920, you know, then the name Kenya, you know, 1920. But, but then it, the, the kind of uh, logic of governance at that time, it was that a few people had decided um, in the name of white settlers 
Um, and and of course the the colonial ad, 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 ad administrators. A few people, a few people had decided that they could they could they could govern the entire territory, right? That they could control its fate, that they could decide its economic its economic policies, everything. Um, right. and, and and this became the the logic of governance in Kenya up until 1963 when we were gaining independence, right? So the 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 cohorts that took over power from 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 the colonialists continued that political logic. They did not know anything else, right? They did not know things like participation, broad-based mass mobilization. In fact, they demobilized the nationalist movement, you know, um, 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 someone like Tom Boyer actually, who was a very important uh, figure in the, in the labor union movement in the 1950s, is the one who actually kills it in the 1960s. Um, and this is because not only is, is institutionally, the way the state was organized, the executive was more powerful than parliament and judiciary and civil society, but also the political elite who took over the executive branch um, had, had been socialized to, to rule in such a way that they did not need to listen to the voices of the masses, right? That they were, that they were, that they're the, they're the ones who knew uh, where the country needed to head. But such a political system is only possible, and and you know this. I'm I'm describing Kenyatta's rule, but that was only possible if those elites have a bit of consensus around that system, right? Um, um, and and to have consensus around that system is is if there is enough revenue and money to to wed this this political elites within 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 the system, right? So for them to to legitimize the system. So if you have if you have Rangala from the coast. You have Ngei from Ukambani, you know. You have all. We have all. All these. All these political leaders were representing the, their ethnic uh, regions to legitimize Kenyatta's rule. But for Kenyatta to keep them at the center, there had to be revenue and money um, um, to basically oil that system, right? So when Moi becomes president, this no longer becomes possible, right? Um, um, and, and therefore, we, we witness an episode of elite fragmentation. So elites elites begin to. You know, Moi in the 1980s, known as the dark period in Kenyan politics, becomes becomes very very paranoid, especially with the 1982 coup, and therefore is basically killing off the system. And and um, leaders who had been respected in their regions are either in exile, are in, are, are are detained without trial, or or, or even end up dead. Uh, but of course, in the 1990s, that could no longer hold. So what we see in the 1990s is 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 is, um, is extreme uh, fragmentation at the center. Um, and violence um, 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 at the at the at the at the local level. Um, but what is important, and this is the point I'm trying to make here, is that during the 1990 period of informalization, right, where we are moving from from a quietist economic system where a few elites are are, are, are getting all the all, all the benefits of independence, and others are just following. In the 1990s, it's different because in 1990s, in, you know, informalization enters, um, 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 sort of like a deregulation phase, right? And and that period produces this this all sorts of all sorts of hustlers, right? Um, um, uh, what we call new money, right? Um, uh, it, that begins in 1990s. So if you if you trust the if you trust the the economic history of 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 individuals such as Hassan Joho, such as Sonko, such as Ruto, like if you if you if you trace the economic history, it all goes back to something that happened in the 1990s, right? And, and and the 1990s ushers this period of 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 this of the of the inter of the new entrepreneurial spirit, who does not necessarily need to have gone to school or anything, but they can do some to deals here and there and make money, right? So, it is this kind of generation. That is raised by the more years of informality, that is now clashing with the generation of the sixties and the seventies, right? Um, um, and represented, of course, at the top by Uhuru Kenyatta and Raila Odinga. I mean, their fathers were the leaders of the political elite of the sixties and seventies, right? And that elite is now fighting or competing for power with the elite that was born by the times of the nineties, you know, and the early two thousands. You know, these difficult periods. Um, um, I, I really like what Darius was talking about in Nairobi now when you ask someone what they do. Um, 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 it's, it's, actually, it's actually sort of like a taboo question. Yeah? Um, um, but but, but, but these this, this, this times were born out you know, 
you, you can trace them to the 1990s, yeah? Um, when people are living in universities and there are no jobs, right? Like, right, the, the, the time of the expanding Juakali sector, for example. So, right. so, you have, so you have all these Babu Winos, you have all these characters that have now, because the new constitution has opened political spaces that have now entered the political field, yeah? Um, um, they are now MCAs, they are now MPs, they are becoming senators and they're becoming governors. And they want to also, unfortunately, they don't want to transform the system but they want to be included in the system, right? So the system mm. needs to open up. Now what the BBI is doing is that the BBI is actually closing off the system by reconcentrating power to, on, the, on the presidency. And in Nairobi, you know, the president with the, with, the, with the latest BBI report, the second BBI report, the president gets to appoint not only a cabinet, but the prime minister and two deputies. Um, the president uh, gets to appoint the chair of what will be the National Police Council uh, that then Get, ends up controlling the police. The, the president appoints an ombudsman who sits at the judiciary. So, so the BBA actually really proposes to decentralize power at the center. Yet, as our history is showing us, um, 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 the more the more we the more the more the country grows, um, 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 the more people will begin to ask for power and position, right? Um, um, and the BBI is going against that. And I think that is what William Bruto symbolizes now. Like, William Bruto symbolizes this when, I think, it, I think it was a very clever move to pick up on this name Hustler because, because, because everyone, everyone, everyone now, most people in Nairobi now describe themselves as, they, they describe themselves as, as, as Hustlers, meaning Fanya Biashara, a hustle too, right? And I think like it's, it's, it was a very clever political move to tap into that emotion. Um, 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 an emotion of people feeling that a certain political elite needs to go away and we need to be in charge. Not necessarily to change our, our political traditions or, or to transform the system, but to also continue what the old guard was doing, but now for more people, right? Mm -hmm. and, right. and the BBI is at the center of that struggle. <laughs> Interesting, Shiko, just... Uh, uh... Uh, to, to come to come to come to you. I mean, uh, in on June first, uh, the president, the president in his Madaraka's day speech, uh, said that uh, constitutions shouldn't be yokes and to and to us as a people, but they need to be fluid and agile. Uh, to, to paraphrase him, not 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 verbatim, meaning that we should change that. Uh, I mean, in your perspective, and, and he was he was making a case for for BBI for the BBI process and the BBI document to pass through, uh, it being a yoke. In your, in your perspective, uh, does, how, how has the constitution of Kenya really opened up the space for, for more players to, to, to engage with him? And what, what do you think BBA wants to do in this regard for, is, is, it, is, it, is it closing the political elite or it's, or it's really closing up, just for a phrase in Gala, is it, is, it, is it holding a yoke on the political elite? The BBA basically is meant to come and shut most of us up and uh, sort of strengthen the spaces for the elites. And these are like very specific people. Um, for me, the constitution 2010, uh, sort of like, I think Gala has said it very well. And you see the challenge is when, you, when you're talking after someone's wisdom who's able to put things diplomatically, you're not able to, to actually articulate your own issues. But um, the point is, when, when the constitution uh, 2010 came to pass, the funny thing is that I was a child. I didn't know what was happening. I only knew we, we had red, uh, bananas and oranges. That is the much I can remember. And then I remember at some point we had colors for whatever reason. But now being that I'm benefiting from this constitution in what way? My freedom of expression is out here. I'm able to speak. I'm able to say, you know what, this is it. Public participation, which has never been followed, which has never been implemented in any way. So we have uh, so many documents that support this. Um, this is one of the things I think BBA is coming to close down on. This is when, when the president wants everything to be up to him appointing so and so, then are we not, um, are we not trying to sort of close this so-called yoke in a way that it's only the political elite who are able to do some things. It's only through the president that some things are able to move. When you tell me that the president now is going to uh, appoint the Ubuntsman who goes to sit in the judiciary, uh, and then you also tell me that the president will also appoint um, the, uh, the uh, prime minister. 
at what point does the opposition of this country has a voice, have a voice? At what point do we say that the president is wrong when he's wrong? And I honestly feel like uh, BBI is meant to strengthen the dictatorship. The male dictatorship of Uhuru is about to be strengthened by that document. And that is why he's so courageously telling you people that, oh, we don't have money for an election in 2022, but we have money for BBI in 2021, which doesn't make sense at all. Mm. That, oh, we need to move. Like the ABC has the courage to come and tell us that we, we are not ready for an election, but how ready are they for the BBI? Why did right. they say we're not ready for a referendum at that specific point? Because it's about manipulation so that it works for the best of Uhuru and Raila. So what, what, when I look at it, I just feel like Uhuru will say anything. He does not write his speeches. He probably doesn't even know who writes them. He reads them to you. They look cute, they look beautiful, but there's nothing to it that can be implemented. Mm -hmm. Darius. Uh, the, the, one, of, one of the key, one of the key, the key, the key things that uh, Katiba 2010 did was to was to was to check was check what people what people call the colonial the colonial state, and uh, the independent constitution that that was birthed post 1963 was by and large mutilated. By the time we were changed in 2010, it had been changed fundamentally 39 times. Uh, if you may, one two couple of things. One because you have written about this, you have talked about this uh, in very many spaces. What do we mean by the, by the colonial state? And secondly, what was it about the, the Katiba 2010 that was meant to uh, uh, reform and fix the, this colonial state? And, and within, that, uh, uh, within that context, uh, what does BBI take us forward in, in, in fixing the colonial state or does it actually re-entrench back the colonial state? Uh, thank you, Joe. I think in many ways, um, the workings of um, the 2010 constitution um, are very different from the workings of what we call the 1963 constitution in terms of uh, it being a product of a very brief space within this country where the elite were able to have uh, you know, an honest conversation uh, amongst themselves. And they're able to say, you know what, this centralization of power, this uh, centralization of the Kenyan reality, this um, othering of uh, people who do not fit within certain uh, frameworks of what is considered acceptable to the, to the central state. Um, uh, basically, this new uh, model, this new constitution essentially pushed that out. You know, it ensured that uh, as much power is going into the devolved counties, you know, um, farming up and strengthening some of the, you know, our institutions and especially the judiciary, uh, moving, of course, a lot of this power away from the hands of a few people. And that is a very fundamental, um, you know, aspect of um, our governance system because it creates a kind of uh, what we call checks and balances that ensures um, as the high court firm, you know, you have to do uh, public participation, and you know this is a trend in the constitution, especially when it comes to budgetary issues. You know the the, the civil um, education on people at the constitutional assembly, of course, in as much as it has its flaws, and you know it's been subject to the excesses and you know um, you know basically bullying by the executive. It can still hold; it's there. I mean, we can always come back to it and reform it, and especially if we get more younger people in there who are willing to bring in. And new ideas on how to, you know, basically do, uh, you know, the respective constitutional assemblies, of course. And in many ways, what a colonial state is is basically this uh, logic, and I think uh, Ngala has uh, spoken into it. It's this logic, this model of working that simply erases um, anyone who does not fit within the narrow uh, confines of what it defines as, you know, as a human being, as a Kenyan. And this happened with the land ordinance in 19, uh, is it 1902, uh, the Kiwe tax, of course, the hat tax and a lot of history in there. And this, the logic of this system essentially is, you know, everyone else who does not fit the narrow confines of definition of who is truly Kenyan. And this is never really on paper, but it's built into the workings of the system. You know, you have a police system that was generally built to you know, serve the elites and not you. You have an education system that is built to entrench the tyranny of the 3%. That is why um, 
you look at a country like Kenya, 54 million people, 28.5 million adults, but you only have 900,000 graduates. And suddenly the Minister of Education starts clamping down on that. And, you know, because apparently we have too many graduates because 900,000 is in the, you know, in the logic of that system or exclusionary system is too many people. And especially it's beginning to uh, include the people who, you know, from uh, lower clusters, socioeconomically, regionally, that the system doesn't consider acceptable. And so that logic, I mean, it's built into our education system, it's built into our church system, our religious systems rather, it's built into you know, uh, our policing system, it's built into even how we do infrastructure development in this country, you know? And within all these um, uh, basically outworkings, um, that, that system didn't change in 63. I mean, we made a couple of, we made incremental reforms here and there, you know, hits and misses, setbacks here and there. But largely, the system was able to, you know, sort of sustain its logic through successive, um, you know, uh, parliament through successive uh, presidents, some of whom have given it varying levels of, you know, basically support and operationalization within the country. But now we come to 2010, this system that sort of, in many ways pushes not enough, but a lot of power from the center relative to what we've done before. And of course, you can understand the recoil that you're seeing with the elites. I mean, it's what, again, Galato mentioned in the, in, you know, 63 happens, you know, the Majimbo system comes in, but then within a short period of time, you realize that the colonial logic always wants to work in a way that everybody gazes at the center and the center decides, you know, basically is the theater of the political elite, you know? And so there's this recoil and the Majimbo system is thrown out. 2010, we basically recreated 63 in certain aspects and barely within what, we're barely 11 years into this, we're seeing the same elite do the, that very gut reaction of, you know, uh, colonial uh, perpetrators who are basically recoiling again because Within this system, power is not supposed to be people, whether it's social power, economic power, um, widening the definition of who gets to be Kenyan or who is Kenyan and how this works for everyone else. And so within that understanding that if this is this is a very, if I will, natural reaction of the elites within a system that was built to centralize everything. That once power begins to get out of that space, social power, political power, economic power, representation, uh, voices in terms of include, including young people, you know, people in the northern uh, region and maybe other in the coast, in, you know, in Nyanza for the longest time with the marginalization. Once you begin to bring these people, uh, to give these people more power in terms of how uh, shaping the, the fate of the country, shaping the fate of, you know, of, of you know, their respective uh, regions, then they literally always react back. They want to claw back on that power. And in as much so, in as much as they're promising you 35% devolution, it wouldn't mean much if the same person gets to control all these other respective seats and appoints all these other people around him, which are really supposed to be powerful positions appointed by one person who's even now almost all powerful and is almost sort of uh, you know, a shield around themselves to protect themselves from the kind of accountability that, you know. Uh, redistributing power, distributing power does to basically that seat and the people around him, so to speak. Mm. Um, just, right. just, just to reiterate what I said very, very briefly. So, so the 2010 constitution was named, we, we said it picked on the American style presidential system, yeah? Um, uh, even the way it created the, the Senate, um, um, you know, a bicameral leg, the, 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 the legislature and this presidential system. But why, um, you know, in a, in a country of over 300 million people, the United States, um, why have they not felt, why have the political elites there not felt that they need to increase more positions at the center? It's simply because there are so many people who are in charge of running the country, right? Through the federal system. Um, 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 and therefore people do not feel um, that, that they will not get a job or 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 their or their or their keto will not will not will not um, have a place to go, Be basically do not have a market for your products, because the president is not is not from your area, right? Um, so in Kenya, how do you create a system where um, people don't have to fight because their guy did not win the election, because their life because they feel that their life will continue the same way it used to be, if if 
you, that, 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 you, that your children will still go to school and that, they'll, and that there'll be books there, that there'll still be security, that, that, that your children will still be promised of a job after, 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 after finishing university. Um, if people feel that these things are not threatened, you know, these, these basic life things are not threatened, um, um, I don't feel that they will need to fight for, for a person um, uh, who's from their region to be president. And the only reason why people feel that they need to do that is because this, the system is so much centralized. And even when you had devolution, that was not even powerful enough, or it's not really what people wanted. The, the, current, the, the current administration has worked against this devolution as well. This, this kind of devolution did, that, that doesn't have the power. So this need, right, just to support what Daryl was saying, this need to always, to always centralize power at the center, I feel is the problem, right? And I feel that the, the only way we're going to have this thing we're calling inclusivity and lasting peace is if we allow many people to be control of their own fate and to be control of what we call, to, to, to actually take part in, 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 in governance and not a few people in Nairobi. Mm. Just, I mean, just to just to pick, before, before I go back to Shiko uh, Ngala, I mean, in the, in the last couple of years, I mean, uh, from 2020, 2013 to 2017, we saw, saw a fairly, fairly active, fairly active judiciary, you know, uh, pushing back very many of uh, uh, presidential uh, executive orders and call it, uh, uh, saying that many of them were illegal. In 2017, the same judiciary uh, annulled the presidential election. Uh, on June June second uh, this year, uh, the BBI judgment, the High Court uh, called the, 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 the BBI process unconstitutional, uh, null and void. Uh, what, what do what do you what do you make what do you make of of a judiciary? What do you make of of this this particular judiciary within a context so that the judiciary in the in the colony was a kangaroo court? So how how do we make that transition? But more importantly is. Uh, it seems it seems in, in very many regards that the judiciary has become the last arbiter for 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 Kenyans for Kenya's struggle. Uh, is, is is that a good is that a good way to go for Kenyans whereby all our political uh, problems we run to the judiciary? Yes, uh, and I think look, like if the judiciary is is doing its job, right. that is just basically another way of saying that we need to be a country um, that that follows the rule of law. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what the judiciary the judiciary protects the law and makes the law work, right? So if the right. judiciary is not working, then you're not a country that is based on the rule of law. That's what right. that's that's exactly what it means. But then the question is, how did we get there? Like how how do we now have an, an, an judiciary that um, is very is very independent and 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 can can make decisions that go against the wishes of the executive? This this has not been our experience, right, in our history. Um, um, how do you explain that? And I think I've, 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 I've argued elsewhere um, that that the 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 serious fragmentation at the center, you know, when elites are busy fighting themselves at the center, that is when you have witnessed the most fundamental transformations in this country, actually, right? But when the elites have agreed on the rules of the game, that is when that is when basically like the whole country is going to come under their domination, right? Um, um, so it is very instructive to note that the new constitution, well, now it's, not, it's no longer new, but the 2010 constitution comes into being after the post-election violence, right? So, so and, and it's, it's important to think about this kind of crisis moments and how they, and how they uh, ush, usher um, 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 interesting developments after, right? So, so our first crisis, crisis, crisis point um, was the Mau Mau in the mid-1950s. Um, um, where the colonial state could no longer hold, right? Immediately after that. The second crisis point is the post-election violence, right? Where this serious elite fragmentation that, has, that, that had been happening since the 1990s, needed, it needed to be stopped. People needed to actually agree on, 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 on the rules of the game, right? And, and that is basically the National Accord of 2008, which produces this new constitution. But since political trust was still very low amongst the political elite, that gave an opportunity for voices to come from outside and to make sure that the new constitution is protected. So that even when you want to amend it, you'll have it will the, the guardrails of amend the constitution are going to be so high, right? It it also this kind of lack of political trust between the in, in the political system where in, within the political elites who are busy trying to fix each other. It allowed for 
people in the committee of experts um, to create provisions within the new constitution that would then create a very dependent judiciary and also dependent constitutional commissions, right? So for, for, for the politicians at that time in 2010, it's very important to look at the political environment that produces these changes. The politicians in 2010, they were all busy thinking about who's going to become next president after Mwai Kibaki, right? And therefore, how do you use the new constitution to do that, right? So I am very sure that they did not even pay a lot of attention to the details of that new constitution, right? Um, 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 so long as people have agreed, um, 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 uh, you know, as they did in Naivasha in, 20, in, 20, in 2009 and 2010, there was no longer points of debate that were very serious, right? I think actually the, the people who opposed the, the new constitution in 2010, in this constitution in 2010, did not even raise serious matters of, 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 of the structure of government. They were talking about things like abortion and things like that. So, 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 but what the political elite, which is why I'm saying that sometimes they're not very smart, is that they did not know that they were passing a constitution that would, in very few short years, go against their interests, right? Mm. And I think it is now becoming very, very apparent. Yeah. Right. I mean, and Shiko, I mean, just to, I mean, so therefore, Shiko, how do we, how, how do we, start building or keep keep building a critical mass of youth because you you work with youth a lot particularly around for them to to have a critical mass of people who who support endorse and actually apply constitutionalism uh, within the context of katiba 2010 how do we how do we start because in in a sense that there, 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 there have been very many uh, false starts even even with regards to progressive forces you know, uh, uh, recently we were with you, uh, recently uh, at the Sabah Sabah uh, convention and the, the convention around there were very many folks around how do, you, how do you start to build a critical mass of people to, to now be in the process of implementation, but even just, but on top of that, to, 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 to endorse and legitimize constitutionalism within, within, within Kenya. So I will say, uh, we need to understand that the work of mobilizing and speaking on people's problem is not the work of the civil society because we've made it our business. We've made it that this is, this is our work. Our work is to speak for the people. We must stop speaking for these young people. We must allow them to speak for themselves. We must start working with them instead of working for them. Because uh, one thing that I've learned over time and uh, uh, over the few years that I've been in this space is that even when we say we are organizing, we want to organize the way our forefathers organized. We are forgetting that we have sort of evolved, especially with the new technology, we have evolved in terms of how people react to problems. Like it's only in Kenya where Mafta in a panda to anakwamia misi na gari, so I knew so. Then you forget that the same time, at the same time that that fuel goes up, your unga at your kibanda will go up. So it's just that we do not have this knowledge and this is where we need to start. We honestly, honestly need to be honest enough and tell ourselves about the actual history and the true history of this land. Because sometimes I listen to people speaking and when Gala was talking about our history, I, 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 I smile because there's one thing I keep saying, majority of us as young people, especially the nineties going back to two uh, thousands, we barely know this history. We barely know what happened um during those times the history we read in school is quite corrupted that we are meant to praise the oppressors that we are meant to uphold the people who have been stealing from us ever since so we must acknowledge that it's time we organize but organize thinking that the generation we are targeting is very different we must allow the youth to be part of these spaces that we're talking mm -hmm. about and we must also think about um and this is one thing, and I think Joe, I mentioned that when we were with you uh, just the other day, is that instead of looking at the youth who are always on their phones as quote unquote idiots, look at this as an opportunity. Look at this as a way that we can actually start mobilizing using those things. The same way if something small happens, it turns into a meme and goes viral, is the same way our revolution can go viral. If we only organize and allow these young people to be like, you know, meeting them at their own problems. If you tell a young person right now about taxes and all this, they will tell you I file zero returns. 
But if you start telling them from the point of where you are unemployed and where you went to school for four years to tarmac for the next 10 years is because this government doesn't like you and this is what is happening, then maybe we will start changing the narrative. We must start changing the way we approach things. We must also say, if the civil society does everything, what is the role of the government? And I keep telling people, if we go to solve people's problems, then the people do not need to pay taxes to the government. We must start capacity building people to be able to understand that they deserve the best and they should demand the best because the government owes them. They do not owe the government. Literally, we, we give money to this government so that it can render our services. But instead, we give them money to loot and they borrow on top of it. So maybe it's time we start having this genuine conversation. And as we talk of organizing, can we also be genuine with ourselves and say, let us also bring in the new brains, the new energy, and this, um, this block that we call the young people on the table. Let us stop making boardroom decisions to solve solutions in this country. Okay. Darius, very quickly, I mean, I, I'd, I'd like to open this up to some questions from our viewers and audiences, but uh, very quickly, uh, Part, 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 of, part, of, part of negating uh, people, humanity, or a segment of society is always to freeze frame them. And uh, the, youth, the youth in this country for, for, for a long time have freeze framed, uh, as I mentioned earlier, within two categories, either as the, as the face of violence and these are uh, two ones who, who go around, you know, uh, uh, investing in crime and investing in crime and drugs and all, all, all sorts of vices. Or on the other hand, there are this cluster that are uh, Helpless and needs to be saved. From at, at, at a level of language, how do how do we begin to move to move this conversation? To stop seeing the youth within these two frames and to them as actual active citizens of this country who can participate in governance, uh, not, not at the point of mobilizing for these big politicians, but invest, uh, who can actually lead, can steer uh, progressive conversations, debates, legislation, policies for this country. It's a well-wired system that ensures, you know, you don't get to see them as, you know, people who should be, you know, in the room making this, those decisions. And as I said, um, there's much more nuance that, you know, younger people can be able to bring into this conversation. I know we did partly did that in 2018 with the Millennial Series, where we were basically saying, you know, our story is not about IG and Java. It's about the fact that systems and processes in this country do not allow... Uh, a lot of young people, so many young people, to be able to move through these ranks and to be able to be, to, you know, to make meaningful contribution to the society. But also, there are so many young people out there who are trailblazing, are doing incredible, incredible uh, things in fantastic spaces out there. And I think it's important to tell their stories. You know, not all all of them, of course, but. As I mentioned earlier, like in politics, you have a governor who basically fit the criteria of uh, young people. Uh, his performance, of course, is something you'll be able to unpack and say, did he perform well, didn't he? I mean, you have about 60 something uh, among uh, the, the member of parliament, among those who vied. We have so many MCAs who fit that category and that's just in politics. You can have the same conversation within um, activism spaces. One of the most important things to do to break um, uh, this passivity and pathology kind of very strict frames given to the youth is to bring in nuance, is to tell the story of the diversity of pursuits, of talents, of ideas, of accomplishments um, that, you know, and of interests that young people are pursuing, whether it's in politics, in law, in philosophy, in academia, you know, in recreation, in whatever, uh, in and in every space that uh, young people are existing. So I think it's very, very important to invest within, to invest in nuance in telling the story of young people. And so that you don't end up with this um, facility, pathology, but also um, I think it's something uh, Ngala had mentioned that the, the youth are a monolithic cluster, which they are not, you know. By being able to bring nuance into conversation about young people, you're able to break these sort of, you know, very strict ways in which, uh, and very convenient ways in which they try to define youths, such that, you know, uh, they're not allowed at the table of decision making. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks for that, uh, Darius. I just want to quickly uh, go to go to some of the questions that that have been raised for to the panel. Uh, the, the first question is by uh, Othiambo uh, Omino. Uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, this question I'll shoot to to Tungala. And, and Othiambo asks, uh, uh, "What do you think? What do you think of the foreign influences in processes such as BBI? Uh, and do you know do you know of any such foreign influences that have uh, in matters on BBI?" From what we know, I mean, the answer is no, right? So, like, the money came from the government. In fact, the in fact the um, uh, the case against the BBI was 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 um, was raised in the in the sense that it it was it was it was primarily a government executive project, um, um, uh, but that that used public funds. Um, um, however, I have to say that at the, the the pressure that 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 may have informed the the um, the um, Coming up with the BBI or the handshake, um, the the international community did actually have a hand in that, right? In pressuring the government to come up with a solution, especially those uh, a few months after after August twenty seventeen, when 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 we went for the election. But I am I am not aware of um, of uh, any any underhand foreign foreign influence that has supported the BBI process, either financially or even politically. No, I'm not I'm not aware of that. Uh, Dennis Kimathi, thanks, thanks for joining us. And, and he asked, and this question, I'll uh, shoot it to you, Darius. Uh, and he asked, assuming the court of appeal agrees with the petitioners of BBI, uh, what are the chances of us having a referendum within uh, the current constitutional framework? Um, uh, first of all, just uh, to respond uh, to the question that uh, uh, asked Tungala, yes, there was, um, there was a document that was um, online. Somebody was able to basically catalog um, the number of organizations um, from around the world who, uh, in a certain way, was uh, you know in support of uh, these amendments, and uh, not sure to what levels they are offering um, whatever support they are offering, but definitely uh, once the issue was flagged, then uh, I think a lot of them publicly, a number of them publicly, you know, stated their withdrawal whether it was in monetary or political support or you know, a diplomatic uh, sort of endorsement, uh, in, a, in a sense, advisory to you know, the whole um, BBA, basically infrastructure. Um, coming back to uh, the question you had asked, one of the, uh, there's, there's a report that came out um, just before we started out um, on the BBA conversation and one of the biggest predictors of um, a civil unrest in a country is a referendum. And it, there's an entire report run, and I think the entire uh, public uh, repository of uh, this information that a lot of countries go to war within um, or uh, 24 months before or 24 months after, actually 12 months before or 12 months after a referendum. And that is because a lot of referendums are really informed by, uh, you know, a society's uh, self-reflection and the desire to, you know, sort of move itself forward or change certain provisions. Most often, um, referendums are an acknowledgement of, you know, basically uh, a split within the elites. You know, it's, the, it's usually the collapse of elite consensus that drives most referendums um, in a lot of countries globally, and you can. Pick, pick any countries with any major sort of uh, civil uh, dysfunction, uh, you know, especially that plays out even into a war or political, you know, sort of violence. And you can always stress there was a referendum somewhere within the 24 months of that, um, uh, or within 12 months of that document. So having it now, and then having an elections right up ahead in which uh, the president and the vice president have fallen out, coupled with, uh, you know, a referendum in itself, which is quite unpopular, and an economy that is, you know, not fully functional at this point in time, that is a recipe for trouble. You know, all, all the legal um, uh, frames around it, notwithstanding, of course, um, uh, the, the, the eventuality or the inevitability or the possibility of a referendum will be decided by, you know, of course, the courts. But it's a very, very, uh, you know, risky political game to play within a nation, that you go to a referendum within a period where you also have an election that is so hotly contested. 
A referendum after that may be a possibility. Of course, it will still be challenged within the current provisions that have been given. You know, there, as I mentioned, a civic education, a public participation, constitutional assembly, and the referendum itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, thanks Darius. Uh, Shiko, uh, Dennis Kimathi asks you again. Uh, uh, within this context of BIBA, there have been also conversations that have come uh, regarding uh, academic qualifications for members of parliament and uh, uh, members of county assemblies. Uh, Dennis Kimathi asks, uh, what, what, do, what do you make of this? Wow. Um, I think this is quite an interesting conversation. And the only question I keep asking people when they ask me that is, if we expect a secretary in a bank or in a shop or wherever uh, this person, a receptionist for that matter, to have a certain degree, why don't you expect someone who's going to make decisions that affect your life, hold billions that you pay in, uh, in form of taxes and also budget for the well-being of your life and the services you get, go in there without a degree? Why is it that we have to be very double standards in a way that if I'm electing you into power, I'm doing you a favor, you don't need degrees, go buy yourself clothes. Yet I'm paying you, I'm facilitating all your well-being. But for you to actually get a job, you need a degree, 10 years experience and all these things. Maybe on top of a degree, we need someone with also five years uh, work experience in certain places to get these positions. Because I feel like we've gotten so many people in power who have no idea of what is their role there, have no idea on um, even the specific seats they serve, what are the roles and what are the JDs uh, to be precise. So we end up uh, screwing ourselves over and over again because we rely on people who are not even open to learning. And I, I, I want to take us back to when the campaigns, of course the campaigns are always here, but isn't it always worrying when an MCA comes and tells you within the first 100 days of me being in that seat, I'll, I'll, I'll build schools, I'll build a hospital, I'll make roads. Isn't that a red flag? Isn't that one thing that we should be like, we cannot elect this person. That is not his mandate. He cannot, where will he get the money from? So. The fact that we never have these conversations, the fact that um, we have been lied to again and again, maybe having it mandatory for people to go to school, get educated, and also get some experience before buying for these seats will be like prudent for us as a country. Mm. Interesting. Uh, another question uh, from, from, from the panel, uh, Purity uh, Mukami. I can just chip in briefly on the conversation. Yes, yes, please, yes, please. Um, on, 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 on the qualifications uh, conversation, it, it's there is a certain way in which um, the, the public space uh, is suddenly is currently um, disadvantaged when we go with uh, with the degree. No doubt, it's it's a very important document for that. But I'm thinking, if you're a country of 28.5 million um, adults, uh, you've constrained your education system such that it's only awarded it to 900,000. Um, there is a 2018 report, I think June, which basically says, um, you know, uh, in Kenya right now, um, children of the top 10 percentile are 48 uh, times more likely to make it um, uh, to university. Middle class kids are three times more likely to make it to university. I understand the necessity of, you know, a university degree in, uh, in, in, in this uh, Dispensation and how it helps us to, you know, basically legislate and all that. But then there's this conversation to have on, you know, by having a degree, it's important in terms of how it helps, you know, with the cognitive and intellectual conversations um, for, you know, and, and then policy conversations for, you know, the legislatures and the respective political offices, but on how exclusionary also it will become um, for a lot of people, because it will basically say of your 28.4 million adults, 27 point something basically don't qualify for public conversations. How about if we took this provision a different way and said, there are a certain number of modules within Kenya School of Government, which as long as you have the bare minimum, which now is a form for certificate, you have to take X number of modules. And that essentially ensures that, you know, you were able to qualify as part of, you know, basically our uh, IEBC co uh, qualifications. That ensures you're not, being highly exclusionary in a system that the education system has been very exclusionary, but also it ensures that the people it so uh, don't get in there simply because you know uh, we don't lock people out. So can we have a third way such so that you know uh, you're not locking everyone out and you're also not allowing anybody to 
you know, has barely, um, uh, you know, any bare minimum understanding of how government works, getting into this position. Yeah. Yes. Well, thanks, 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 Darius, for that. Uh, uh, Shiko, another question for you from uh, Purity, Purity, Purity Mukami. Uh, and, and she asks, uh, thanks, Purity, for, for joining this uh, webinar. She asks, how do you distribute the power away from Nairobi more, uh, other than adding through money that goes to the counties? Well, what are some of the things that we can do to distribute power and resources to the, to, away from Nairobi? Basically, I was talking about is how do we decentralize resources away from Nairobi and the, uh, the, 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 the elites who want things centralized? Um, I think that's quite an important question. And I think uh, Gala sort of expounded on this earlier on. But for me, it's about understanding that devolution was not meant for just finances. It did not just mean the 15% that goes back to the counties. This meant that even um, industrialization, when you talk about the Paris title, when you talk about this, but funny enough, this government of ours has been able to sort of be corny enough to devolve things that they feel like, okay, this can do, but also to retain things that give them more money. Like the youth as a block, youth is never devolved. Uh, you talk about the youth enterprise is still an issue of uh, national government. Uh, but the question I keep asking is, if we can devolve health, why not devolve youthhood? Why not take it back to the counties for them to run their own issues with their uh, own young people? But one thing I keep saying is that uh, we have the 30% tenders uh, to youth that is a scam. Maybe we need to take control of that. Uh, we mm -hmm. have um, the Youth Enterprise Fund that is also another scam. We used to also take control of that. If we are able to bring these resources back to the youth, and if we are able to uh, build skills and create a system that works for our young people, then that makes sort of will enable us to make the first step. My only fear is that where I come from, especially we are three hours from Nairobi, and what happens is I graduate today and I move out tomorrow to move to Nairobi to look for uh, opportunities. Maybe we need to also start pushing our county government to sort of uh, start looking for investors to come and invest uh, in our counties. Maybe that will also open up um, the industrial space and give us more opportunities. But as long as we still see kazi kwa vijana kama kuchimba mitaro, kuosha cho, eh, na kufagia barabara, then we will never move. Mm. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. I just, I just like to jump in there. Um, so like, and as, oh, so, so yeah. Sorry, sorry, Ngala. That's yes. interrupt you. As you're jumping there, there's a yes. question for you. You can answer both because okay. uh, right. of the okay. of time. Okay. Uh, so there's yeah. Martin, Martin Ngoni. Uh, he asks you specifically and he says, uh, uh, going forward, what happens to the rule of succession politics? Uh, uh, and where does that leave? Uh, where does that leave? The, where does that leave the, the, the current political players within the context of BBI? And and and, and it mentions to you particularly for for them and and within the context of marginalized communities. And this is do you see? Because it says you're from the coast. Where does where does that leave twenty two twenty two politics within this current uh, political context? Yes. Um, so I, I I just wanted to add on to on to, on to the previous question regarding. How, how else to decentralize beyond money, right? I, I, I think that was the question. And I, and I, and I feel like um, I, I'm, this, is, this, is, this is my favorite topic, actually. Um, it was actually the subject of my master's thesis some, some, some seven years ago. And, and, and I was looking at the costs, right? And, and the, the clamor for devolution, is if you look at BOMAS, if you look at the Lancaster conversations, it was not only about money. In fact, it was not about redistribution of money. It was about a distribution of power, right? So, so, that, so that people, um, um, if, for example, this, this, this is an example that was given that, that, that came out of Bomas. If, if people, for example, in a place like Tana River or Garissa feel that they need to have control over the police, who police them in their region, they should be able to do that, right? This is the kind of power people are talking about when it comes to decentralizing power away from Nairobi. Um, um, it's it's also power about the policy process. So they've yes, and I hear people always saying that you know health services have been devolved, but health. But but I think the devolution there that has happened is you have, you have devolved management. You've not devolved power. You've not devolved power over the policy process around health. The power mm -hmm. still resides at Afia House, if you ask me, right? Um, the power still resides at Kemsa, right? Like the, the, when people talk about power, it's power to decide to make policy around an issue, right? 
um, um, and to have power over that, not, not to follow what the national government is dictating should happen across the territory. That's why we still have irrigation house in Upper Hill, right? Um, 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 and and this, this is the kind of thing that Kenyans wanted to be, you know, to be corrected through devolution. And it really, and it really hasn't happened. Um, the other question about where we are moving towards 2022, I, I, feel, I feel this is more of like a political analysis question. Um, um, and I'm not, I, I'm not a political prophet, I, 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 and I don't claim to be. Um, um, but but I, I, feel that, I, I feel that for places like the coast and Northeastern Kenya, um, which, which for me, sadly enough, seems as if are still operating, like the politicians who are from these regions are still operating as, as um, vibaraka. You know, I'm looking, I'm looking for the, I'm looking for the English word for this. Um, as, as sort of followers of, of, of politicians who, who come mainly from up country Kenya, right? And this is also something that I've always kind of talked about in my work, that that the politicians at the coast right now are talking about which side to pick between what is now the Tanga Tanga movement. And, and the BBI kind of kind of Uru Kenyatta Raila handshake movement, right? Um, um, you do not find still a sort of um, um, regional specific conversation about where the coast should go politically and economically. We still don't have that. We have frag fragments of that, uh, like like um, the um, uh, Jumuiya ju ju Jumuiya ya County Zapwani. But still, the political process is the same. Uh, people looking to join political parties that have been conceived and formed by upcountry politicians, usually coming from a few ethnic groups, as Chico was mentioning earlier. Um, and this is the same for Northeastern Kenya. So, like this, you know, in, within the context of VBI, despite devolution, people from from regions that were were previously marginalized or seemed to have been marginalized, um, are, you know, are still kind of clients of politicians from. You know Nyanza from Central Kenya and following political formations, political movements from these regions, rather than really defining national politics. Um, um, that we we are still not seeing that. So so maybe what I mean in in very real terms, maybe we are expecting that a run a running mate will be chosen from from some of these regions, or or maybe um, um, some promises for cabinet positions from these regions. It is still the same game for me. I don't think like anything transformative has happened um, um, so far. Thanks, 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 Ngala. Uh, Darius, uh, there's a question here from Murethi Monekia. Thanks for joining us at this webinar. And, and he's wondering how do we, because his question is around, how do we expand uh, this kind of engagement within within our communities? But he's, he's focusing his question with, uh, regarding the, how do, we, how do we restructure our public sphere? You know, from this very uh, colonial public sphere, such so that it begins to reflect, reflect the voices and the aspirations and hopes and dreams of the people. How? What are some of the things we can do that uh, moving forward? Uh, I got asks for Yeah, I think the of course uh, the public sphere is always a very uh, complex and a layered space. You know, we all exist. You know, we're in the city. We also uh, out there in our country, and we sort of occupy different small ecosystems within the, 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 the wider public sphere. I think the most important thing is uh, to always say to, uh, and realize that um, the centralization problem has to be, you know, first of all, uh, consistently tackled that um, Nairobi should not be controlling 21% uh, of um, basically our national economy, such that Within this uh, dispensation year, in where um, because of COVID, which you probably will be here for an entire lifetime, such so that a simple spike means if you shut down Nairobi or you limit or minimize um, the business, social, and economic activities around Nairobi, you're already impacting uh, almost 21% of the economy straight up. You know, that, that, that's on a very unhealthy structure, so to speak. I think it's important that, and especially at least to realize that for the proper functioning of this society, for the proper functioning of this country, for the proper functioning of its various levels and systems, it's important that no one single um, uh, space or square kilometer has such a massive and uh, outsized influence on your, on your national reality, such that when you have to do the inevitable kind of lockdowns and, and curfews and all these kinds of COVID measures, 
that you're making such a huge hit on, on, on the overall economy. I think this conversation came up, um, first of all, Nairobi itself controlling 21% is a huge problem. Number two, when Italy was locked down, um, there was a whole area of Madare that was basically, uh, you, know, uh, you know, almost starving uh, because a lot of the, the laborers in Isli come from there. And so when you begin to look at those kind of social settlement systems, your anthropological realities, your distribution of infrastructure, your distribution of income, wealth and opportunity in light of something like COVID, then that should be a biggest motivator to say, move this, you know, reorient your public uh, system, reorient your public square in such a way that, you know, you're no longer um, captive to um, the inevitabilities because we'll do lockdowns and shutdowns and all these things for the rest of our lives, you know. So you almost have to budget for something like a nine month economy in terms of time, but also you have to budget for a kind of an economy that is so redistributed, a public sphere that is so democratized that, you know, you're, able, you're, you're only able to lock down certain small systems and if the other systems can keep functioning in such a way that the overall impact on the economy is minimized. So there's all the motivation to do it. Um, of course, there's all, both uh, economically, there's all the motivation to do it uh, out of the 2007 uh, political uh, violence and the inevitable, uh, you know, uh, fears that came with the, the, the centralized system that we had then. There's all the motivation to do it because technology allows you to do it. You know, people are producing blogs and, and, and you know videos and TikToks from far outside of the city. It's important that especially for um, the clusters that exist within the city to realize that the Kenyan life and the Kenyan society is not emblematic of Nairobi. You know, it, I mean, just to take one example, um, uh, just briefly, um, the the increase in uh, gas prices. I mean, there's a whole breakdown, I think, uh, Kwame uh, uh, or Wino did, which was basically saying um, gas is a very urban phenomenon in, in, in the country. But our conceptualization of it was this is going to impact the entire nation. Of course, there's a whole conversation about how to keep, you know, provide cheaper energy so people don't destroy forests and all that. But in a sense, we begin to see this urban rural divide that is a very, not really urban rural, it's a very Nairobi versus the rest of the country kind of right. a divide that right. we need to tackle um, right up from, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, thank, thank, thanks for that. Uh, the last question actually to Shiko uh, from Bridge Mukami. And I mean, and she's, 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 she's asking that uh, uh, there are very many barriers to the youth engaging in political processes you know, education, economic dynamics. I just, what are some of the things we can do? Because the conversation has always been, particularly within mainstream voices that we need to involve the youth, but a lot of it is rhetoric. But what are those barriers that she's asking that we need to do uh, as the youth, you know, as, as the youth use is not about very carefully, well to, for, 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 for enable to us to break those barriers and enter to those spaces where we can able to engage in the political processes uh, to, to shift the country. Uh, so one, I think we need to allow ourselves to start reading the constitution. It's very unfortunate that you can be in a meeting with over 200 young people and none of them has ever seen the constitution. It's not their fault. This document is rare. And if you're not in the circles where you are interacting with civil society, it's rare for you to find just a copy of the constitution. So yes, we know it's online, but how many of us have the ability to read it online? Also, um, acknowledging that our documents use uh, the elitist kind of English where not a majority of us will end up understanding really much. And that's why we see even when uh, we have court processes and people trying to explain the, the constitution, sometimes you feel like they're also contradicting themselves in this, uh, at the same time. So I think it's up to me and you Mukami to just uh, start breaking down this information uh, to the youth in our circles. I am a believer that um, the each one teach one spirit works best where if I learn something, uh, it's my responsibility to teach the people around me. And it's also their responsibility to disseminate it to the circles beyond them. And I think we have the best platforms right now. We have uh, TikTok, we have Instagram, the reels and everything, and we're making very beautiful uh, videos. So maybe it's time we start also making videos, educating people about these spaces, because for us to meaning, uh, meaningfully engage and meaningfully participate, we have to have the information and we have to have the knowledge. And unfortunately, the people we trusted in terms of coming and giving us the civic education, even of our own constitution, which is the government, failed terribly on that. 
So maybe it's time we just take up the mantle, educate each other, and start also using the spaces that we have. Imagine having social media, which I know, like Facebook now, I think has free Facebook or something. So why don't we use uh, these spaces where they are cheaply available? Uh, we know a majority of our youth can access them. Why don't we use these spaces to just educate each other and see how much we can mobilize each other towards um, achieving a meaningfully participation in political processes? So I just like to give one of you, uh, each of you, uh, pardon me, each of you, just one minute to just give your parting shot as regarding to the question of inclusivity. So, I mean, by and large, uh, all of you are saying the BBI pr process judgment uh, project doesn't give uh, the youth inclusivity to, uh, to political processes, to power, to resources, to economic uh, uh, avenues to, for them to, to, for them to fulfill their hopes, dreams and aspirations. So then as a parting shot, uh, let's give each of you one minute. I'll start with Darius. Then what do we need to do moving forward? Um, I still insist um, young people need to take stock of, of where we are at in terms of our participation in electoral processes, in uh, political party processes, um, and in uh, basically uh, political processes, polit party politics and electoral process, but also to be able to say then where do you go from here? Have you begun the process of organizing of where to get the resources of who's where and doing what such that you're able to build alliances across board? That would be very critical in terms of are stepping into this space and being able to now get our seat at the table and get our ways there. And thanks, Daria. Shiko? So uh, as we take stock and uh, build alliances, I always like to say that as young people, we must acknowledge that even if you file nil returns, you still pay VAT, that is 16%. And now you'll be paying 20% for the TALA loans, I'm sure the loans that you always take. Um, just for us to understand that if you're sleeping hungry today, there's someone who should be held accountable. And those are the people you elected uh, into those political seats. If you cannot afford uh, rent, if you you're not able to even get a job, if you're not even able to access uh, education systems and health systems in Kenya, there is someone who can be held accountable. And the moment you start holding those people accountable is the moment you start taking charge of our political processes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shiko. Uh, finally, Ngala. Yeah, I think for me, just reiterating what has already been said, um, I, I don't I never, I never bought the idea that the BBI um, um, actually was looking out for the youth. Um, and 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 again, for me, this kind of economic language, when it always, when when when, when always it, it comes to thinking about and dealing with the youth, um, um, is old. I mean, the youth are interested in power, and and I and I and I'm, and I'm I mean power with a capital P. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the youth need to, their voice needs to inform serious political processes in the country. And I think the question should be, maybe in the next discussion, how should you create that? How should you create um, a critical mass of young people who can then begin to really disrupt the political system in a very serious way? Um, for me, that, that, that would be the part of the Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, panelists, uh, Gala, Daria, Shiko. Thank you for, for those who are watching, who are streaming on YouTube and on, and on Zoom. Uh, uh, thank you, our, our viewers. Uh, this, this video will be, will be up on, our, on, our, on the Elephants and, and Henrich Paul YouTube pages. So uh, please be sure to subscribe, to follow, to follow, to follow our channels, at, uh, to follow our channels, subscribe to our Twitter, uh, Facebook, and uh, Facebook and and Twitter, Facebook, and and and, and subscribe to our, to our website, our newsletter. Uh, again, as I said, this video will be up on our YouTube pages, both at the Elephant uh, YouTube pages, elephant.info, and at uh, the Henry Ball Foundation YouTube pages. So thank you so much, and uh, uh, Asante Nisana for, for indulging us in this conversation.